as the team is being seated, would you read with me this morning? Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said unto him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that, when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one. He asked the first, How much do you owe my master? And he answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. And he said to him, Take your bill. Sit down quickly. Make it fifty. Then he asked another, And how much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill. Make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of the light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into their internal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Man, that is, in my humble opinion, that is Luke's thesis statement right there. You cannot serve two kingdoms, two masters, two kingdoms. You can't split your brain down the middle and serve both halves. You can't live in a house divided. This is Luke's thesis statement and I'm excited about the Christmas season because we're going to take a, a look at the, the birth stories in the Bible that we've never taken before. And that, that one of the things you're going to learn from Luke's story at Christmas is that Luke is, is talking and announcing the birth of Jesus. He's saying there are two sons of God here. Because you don't think of Barack Obama or George Bush as a son of God, but the people in the Roman kingdom not only thought of their Caesar as a son of God, but if... If they weren't sold out for the kingdom and excited about that, they were forced to make that confession. Caesar is the son of God. Yet, yet Luke is going to announce early in the gospel, but there's this son of God here. And what is Luke doing in the first chapter? What is, I'm sorry, what is Caesar doing in Luke's first chapter? Come on, help me. You know the Christmas story. What did he do? Taxed him. Thank you. The CPA finally spoke up and is the only guy in the crowd who would be honest about it. Come on! Earlier, he's reading the Bible. What are y'all doing in your spare time? Taxes? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, Luke says that, that the, the, the master of this kingdom is issuing a decree that all should be taxed. But what is Jesus doing? Jesus is coming, the Son of God, in a manger with shepherds all around him. You're not going to get much tax money out of shepherds, all right? Amen? I mean, anybody in here working at the lower end of the... Uh, like a preacher down here at the lower end of the income scale. I mean, they're not going to get a lot of tax money out of us. Which kingdom do you want to serve? There's this great story in Jewish folklore, and I want to share it with you today. It's the story of a, a thief who was caught and convicted, and he is going to be executed. And before he is, he says, uh, you know, it's a shame that I would die because I know this secret. I know a secret that I can take a pomegranate seed and I can plant it in the ground and that pomegranate 
tree will grow overnight. And it's just a shame that such a valuable secret would die with a guy like me. So the executioner says, well, let's, let's go back and talk to the king. And he tells the king, and the king says, well, then let's get everybody together and uh, we'll stay this one more day and we'll, we'll get the secret out of the guy before we kill him. So they all gather around and the thief takes the pomegranate seed and he works the ground and he says, now, the secret I know will, will enable this pomegranate seed to grow overnight. But the, here's the catch. Only someone who has never stolen anything can plant it. And being as how I'm a convicted thief, I'm not the one. It won't work. Someone else who's never stolen needs to step forward and plant the seed. Well, of course, the potter speaks up first and says, yeah, you know, I've not been completely honest all my life, and, and I have overcharged people at times, and so I'm not the one. Even the king's own steward steps forward and says, you know, in handling great amounts of money for the king, yeah, there's been a time or two when I've either entered too little or too much. Um, I, I'm, I'm not the one. Even the king says, once I stole a ring from my own father. And then the convicted thief says, you know, powerful, great people like yourselves are unable in all your means to plant the seed, and yet you're going to convict and kill me. You know, it has a happy ending. The king gives the guy a pardon, and, and he's off. What a great story. So, so we come to a story today in our text about about a steward, about a guy who's maybe the, maybe he's a CPA, I don't know what he does. He's, he's keeping count of all of the, the wealth of this very rich man, and he does something completely unethical, and Jesus calls him a hero. You know what confused me as I tried to prepare for this this week, besides the fact that I'm always confused by the Bible and Jesus always challenges me, is the fact that just two chapters ago, just a few weeks ago, I was preaching to you from Luke 14 when Jesus said, don't invite people to the banquet who can turn around and invite you to one of their banquets unless your kindness should be repaid. And Luke seems to be saying, don't do things that can be repaid. You're you're giving away the greater payment, and yet Jesus now is telling this story about a steward who does exactly that. It reminds you of the lobbyist in Washington, doesn't it? Or the, the guy who gets elected promising favors, and then he's got to go back and make good on all of that. You know what? The, the coolest thing that happened to me all week was I was out in public, and I saw a guy with a T-shirt on that said, this is all it said, no scripture, and he just said, Jesus is clear. <laughs> and I'm like... Dude, you should be trying to prepare my sermon this week. <laughs> Jesus is not clear this time. <sighs> so I thought I'd just tell stories. That's what you do and you don't know what to say about the text, right? It's what Tony Campolo does. When he was here so many years ago, he told this story. If you've heard it, forgive me, but just listen. One summer, Tony Campolo wanted to take inner-city kids from Philadelphia, which is where he ministers, and send them off to camp in North Carolina. And being the wise person that Dr. Campolo is, he realized also that, that people get more out of something they're invested in. So he asked each of them to just raise $50. That's all. Bring me $50 apiece. I'll send every one of you to camp for the summer. And so he sent this very large group of inner city kids off to North Carolina. And while they were away at camp, the police were working in their neighborhood and, and putting together details and facts until they finally came to Tony Campolo and they said, you know, you know, these kids you sent to camp, all in their neighborhood are these stolen cars that parts are being fenced off of and, and we're tracing this back and it keeps coming back to your kids here. And Campolo was furious. So as soon as the bus arrived from North Carolina and the kids were ready to get off and come home from camp, he lined them all up outside the bus and boy did he let them have it. What were you thinking, he said. What were you thinking? What were you thinking when you went out and stole parts when I'm putting my neck out for you and I'm sending you to camp for the summer and trying to give you this great gift and you guys go out and steal 
cars. And one of the young men said, Mr. Campolo, where did you think we were going to come up with $50? He said, well, I thought maybe you'd get a job. Did you ever think about getting a job? And another young man said, you don't think that's work? Stealing those cars and fencing all those parts? You don't think that's work? <laughs> he also talks about how he took a group of kids just like that. And he said, I realized the ingenuity of these people. I realized how sharp their minds worked, how good they were at business. And so they put together a business, and I'm going to try to get this right. He said, if I remember, he said they were... They were fencing parts from old telephones. AT&T gave them the old phones. They took all of the working parts out, packaged them, labeled them, and sold them back to AT&T. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> and they built this huge business doing exactly that. Wow. Now that's a good story. Maybe, maybe Dr. Campolo knows more about this text than me. I know another story, it's more painful because it happens in Philadelphia, but it happens in East Tennessee, and it happens closer to home. I know a story about a young man who was very bright, very energetic, and very joyful, and early in school, he began falling behind until he found that he spent most of his school career in ISS, isolated from the other people in the school, his classmates, his peers. And very soon he had fallen so far behind that he couldn't keep up with the curriculum and with the other kids in the class. And so he, he quit school. And, and he began to look for peers places where he did fit in, and, and he began to learn things at an alarming rate. He learned how to buy alcohol without a proper ID. He learned how to use all various sorts of drugs. He even learned how to make methamphetamines. It takes quite a bit of knowledge there's some words involved in doing this I've learned over these last couple of years that are so big that they outweigh words you and I use in our religious vocabularies. Well, one day, the young man falls in love, marries a girl, has a baby. He doesn't realize what none of us realized when we did this too, that babies our constant expense. <laughs> I mean, you think you know, right? But do you remember what it was like? Do you remember? I woke up the day after I got married. I had a one-year-old child in a crib, and I'm looking over there going, whoa, man, <laughs> what have I done? Because <laughs> it's sinking in. So the young man starts to live with the reality that diapers disappear, and you need more. The formula disappears, you need more. And the baby cries, and so you need money. But it's hard for people who don't have the proper education to find a good job. And so he does the only thing he knows how to do. He cooks meth to make money. Sometimes they get caught. Sometimes they die. And sometimes, even worse than both of those, they just live in that kind of hell from now on. You know people like that. You know this young man. It may not be the same one I know, but you know that you know. You may have been that young man, that young woman. Whew. She loved that story. <laughs> well, this is supposed to be a sermon about stewardship. So... Yesterday, I was in class, and I got some stewardship facts from somebody who does stewardship a whole lot better than I do, and I thought I'd share them with you. You know what stewardship is, right? Y'all need to be aware of how you support the church. Time, talent, money. Time, talent, money. You get it? But most of us want to talk about money first, so here's a few things I want to share with you. On the average, every year, Americans spend $8 million going to the movies. 
can it fathom it? I bet that number's down, don't you? Because everybody rents movies now. But $8 million, uh, $14 million on cosmetics. And ladies, y'all looking good today, too. I Trust me, you are. <laughs> $22 million on something that I couldn't even read the rest of my writing on here, but <laughs> you could read it. I bet you could. Here's a good one. We spend $2.5 million a year on world missions. I said $8 million on movies, $14 on cosmetics, $2 million on something I can't even read, and $2.5 million, you get it, it's cut low, on world missions, we also spend $2.5 million a year on chewing gum. So world missions and chewing gum live right here on one plane. If we keep going up, $24 million eating out. I'm doing my share. <laughs> $31 million a year on tobacco products. Somebody spit. <laughs> In a cup, please. $34 million a year playing the lottery. May I take just a moment to say, would you please quit that? Would you please stop that? God knows you might win, and that would mess up everything for you. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm serious. You play and play to win, but look at the winners. They look like losers a year later. You can't handle it. Don't give your money away. Eat out. Go to a movie. <laughs> Chew some gum, but Lord in heaven, quit funding rich people's college scholarships. That was a political comment I should not have made from the pulpit. It does not in any way reflect the views and opinions of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ or even anybody in this room. Like I care today. $49 million on soft drinks. And $58 million on alcohol. So, cut back on the booze, buy a soda. Oh, 22, I'm sorry, Sean, $22 million on hunting. I couldn't read my own writing. <laughs> on hunting. <laughs> I find, yeah, didn't make the list. Didn't make the list, buddy. <laughs> oh, and don't give me that because what hunting lease isn't complete without a guitar, right? <laughs> There's one in every hunting blind, I know. Oh, you know, you can't serve two masters. You know how important it is to give money to the church. And we're working on it right now. I mean, you, it's that time of the year. That's why this text comes up. It's... It's in the lectionary because it's time for you to make a commitment for next year. How will you help fund the church? And so if I were uh, doing a real good job with this text, I would say, do you plan to spend more money on chewing gum next year than you do in your congregation? Or on a guitar? Thanks, Sean. <laughs> or on the lottery? My goodness, really? Is there No one in here is doing that, right? You're definitely not spending more money on lottery tickets than you're dropping in the church till. Surely to goodness you're not doing that. Because if you are, what are you saying? Well, money would solve all my problems. And God's sort of outdated. And cheap, too. Doesn't take much money and God will respond to me. God dances for nickels. You've got to have dollars to play the lottery. Does that hurt any? Hurts me a little bit. Yeah, but you know what? We're not just talking about money. We're talking about passion. Now, here's how they want me to say it. Prayer, presence, gifts, and service, because that's another way of saying it. Stewardship is about prayer. It's about faithfully praying for the church. It is about praying and, and responding to people who you know that you're praying for. Right? And so people that are off... On the other side of the country that you're praying for have all through this week been getting text messages from you to remind them that they're being prayed for because you're responding to people in prayer. Or we're going to put their name in the list and the pastor will take care of it. That's one way of looking at it. You're going to pray for this congregation. Well... Some people are doing it biblically, I think, because they're not here today. They must be at home in their closet praying faithfully that church is good today. 
But the second thing on the list is presence. Presence, presence, presence. Which means two things. Number one, it means you're here. Show up. But presence doesn't only mean show up in the body. It means show up in every other way. Your heart, your mind. Bring it all to church with you. Be present. Don't just walk past somebody and go, oh, talk to him. He looks like he's having issues today. Oh, they don't like me. Oh, she's, yeah. yeah. You know? Presence. Gifts. After you get here, guess what? You all have a gift. God has given every one of you something. Every one of you have at least one gift. Some of you have more than one. Some of you are afraid that the pastor is going to come ask you, would you do so and so? And, and it might not even be the right thing because if you don't speak up and go, you know, help me find my gift or here's my gift, then the pastor might ask you to do something that is not your gift and you'll be miserable. And it won't be the pastor's fault because, you know, somebody has to kind of hold things together. That should be you. Your gifts were given to you to share with God's people, and this is the place in which you share those gifts. Service. I've argued with Alan for the last time. <laughs> Prayer, presence, and gifts should lead you to service. And I, if I had to be honest, I would have to say, in many cases, it's not. Well, there's all kinds of reasons. You know, I can't get up early enough. I can't get there that night. Uh, my schedule is overbearing. I was working late. I was out buying lottery tickets. You know, so I threw that in behind I was working late. Because in America, the one thing you don't step on is somebody's uh, living. I, I, I'll do anything for the church as long as it doesn't require that I can't be at work 60 hours a week. Service is how God reshapes our heart. It's how God takes all these other things. It's how prayer is not lip service anymore. You understand that? You can pray and pray and pray, but if you don't do something, it's how your presence here is not just showing up. It's how your gifts are not just something you're full of yourself with, but it's how you grow. It is the living well center idea. If you don't serve... If you don't get plugged in to somebody else, <laughs> oh, wait a minute. It's clear now. Now I get it. We are like the man, and, and we are just too weak to dig and too proud to beg, and we are too ashamed to admit it. Think about it. What, what God is interested in is not your wealth. You can't serve wealth and God. And, and, and wealth or uh, uh, acquisition. I got to go to work. I got to play the lottery. I got I to gotta achieve. I got to acquire. I got to get more toys because the one who dies with the most toys wins. You'll never win that game. You can't serve yourself. And God, you cannot serve your own ego and serve God. Do you see how much wealth encompasses? And you didn't even think about all that. No, you can't serve your ego because you have to be right all the time and serve God who says that you came to me by doing it wrong, homie. You can't serve yourself and your acquisition and serve God who is agape love or charity. You cannot be concerned with acquiring more and more and more and still be a person who is charitable. You can't serve two masters. And our problem is that God is asking us to be frivolous with the wealth of God's kingdom. Now listen to me. I'm not talking just about money. We're way past that. We need to let go of some of that security that we think it brings us. 
It's for our own benefit. But the things that are of value in God's kingdom are not just money or acquisition or reputation. The things that are valuable in God's kingdom are things like mercy and compassion and agape love, charity. God is asking us to be frivolous with those things. You see, they don't even belong to us. It is not our... Remember how mad the Pharisees got at Jesus because he told someone your sins are forgiven. And you want to make religious folk mad, you go around forgiving sin. You'll make religious folk mad and you'll make angels sing and God will dance a jig in heaven. I guarantee you. Because God said that is not yours to give away. Now get out there and give away all of it that you can, that you will. What keeps us from it? Well... We're weak. We're weak. Too weak to dig. Too weak to do the internal work. Too weak to admit it that we're too proud. Too proud to say, I could have been wrong. Too proud to say, there's a need over here that I could meet. Too weak to show up and say, I have a gift. Man. The Lord's been nudging me to teach a Sunday school class and I just haven't come forward to say anything or to help with breakfast. To do the many things that my congregation needs to continue ministry. I think we're afraid. We're talking about prayer, presence, gifts, and service. We're talking about your passion. That's the simplest way to put it. You're here this morning because you care. You care enough to get out of bed. You care enough to get here. If you're here three Sundays a month, that's how. On a regular basis. If you're here four Sundays a month. If you're here one Sunday a month. If you're a leader in the church, you heard me say earlier, you can't volunteer for leadership. You can't say, oh, make me an elder. He wants to come to you and say, I saw that in you. I remember T. Garrett Benjamin saying, when my leaders stand me up, I call them out. And I say, where were you? Well, I got here. Don't be late. If you're passionate, you'll be early. If you're passionate, you'll be up before everybody in your house is up, dancing around, going, man, it's Sunday. God, I'll never forget how 12 years ago, Sean was the one who told me, I can't wait for Sunday. And people came in here Sunday just like that. They were dancing. They were happy to be here because y'all actually liked each other. And I don't know if y'all like each other. Let me ask you a hypothetical question. And trust me, it's hypothetical because I am way, way too lazy to dig and way too proud to beg. But say I were to resign this position. How in the world would you replace me? Which five or six of y'all would come together as a passionate team to say, we're going to hold this church together? And how many of you would say, that's it. Close the doors. Doug went home. And I am not insinuating that I do all the work around here at all. I'm not saying that. I'm asking, where's your passion? Some of the people who are working really hard might look at me leaving and say, okay, I'm out too. What would you do if the praise team left and you didn't have a great band here to come listen to every Sunday and the music just sort of went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would your passion still be here? What would hold you together? Because one of the things that this text and this sermon is trying to make you understand is how interdependent you are on each other. I don't care if you like each other or if you live on the same side of the tracks. It doesn't matter. If you're going to make this congregation succeed and you're going to stand in the blessing of God, you're going to have to get this interdependence thing right. Well, okay. One more story. I'm going to borrow those glasses I left for Sean up here. He didn't wear them, so I will. (laughs) Y'all know how I love Fred Craddock. And y'all should too. He's a great disciples minister. <clears throat> Fred says this. Most of us will not this week christen a ship. Most of us will not write a book, end a war, appoint a cabinet, or dine with a queen. Most of us will not convert a nation or be burned at the stake. More likely the week will present no more than a chance 
to give a cup of water, to write a note, visit a nursing home, vote for a county commissioner, or teach a Sunday school class, or share a meal, or tell a child a story, or go to choir practice, or feed the neighbor's cat. But please be reminded that whoever is faithful in very little is faithful also very much. Could this be the week that you take someone to dinner? Maybe even here on Tuesday. Could this be the week that you go to the superintendent or the principals of your local schools and you say, I know you have to have kids in here who are in ISS because they're falling behind? And God's given me a gift because I've been given an education and I'm tired of laying it all off on the teachers and the system and principals and I want to step up to the plate and I want to be real and I want to share my gift with God's people because I can read. Would you be that person this week who could read to somebody? Would it be as simple as showing up at your church and saying to the pastor, you know, I know that I've been called to leadership. I know that you've been dependent on me. And I haven't been here. Or I'm not planning on coming back. And I have a really good reason. And pastor, I just want to let you know why. Whoever is faithful in small things is the one who can be trusted with the greater things. The greater things are like faith and hope and charity. And of these, the apostle said, the greatest of all is charity. Pray with me.